post pictures on social media about manifesto and I can see yeah. how they do. And if there happens to be a beautiful woman, oh, yes. uh, a fast car, or like some mm -hmm. kind of like heavy machinery, like masculine kind of, you know, chainsawing or something like that, like, like the, the number of hits just like skyrockets, right? Uh, Absolutely. And they, they know us better than we know us. Welcome to Manifesto. My name's Paul, and this video is a little taste of the work that we're doing on Manifesto Core. We're on a mission to create a new story about men. So if you're curious to hear more, then remember to like this video and subscribe and check out the links below if you're interested in joining our community. Welcome, Jim, to Manifesto's community meeting. Great to be here. Thank you. Good to have you here. Yeah, so it's uh, the 30th of December, just before New Year's Eve. Uh, we've been having a month where we've been talking a lot about money uh, and had different speakers in uh, about, about, uh, about that topic. And we've also been tracking our own personal expenses uh, and usage of uh, like all of our day-to-day -day expenses. Uh, and I've been certainly learning a lot from that. Amongst other things, how hard it is to track how all the money, the things that I'm spending money on all the time. Um, but uh, I'm going to quite it, for quickly introduce you. So uh, you are a former business litigation attorney. You've taught mm -hmm. economics and humanities for 20 years. You've written a whole lot of books. I actually couldn't work out how many books you've written. Um, I can't tell either. <laughs> I'm not counting them either. Okay. The newest book was about is was called Enough Stuff, and it's about appreciating family and friends uh, instead of just getting gifts all the time, especially during this holiday season. So relevant. And and we're going to talk a little bit today. Um, we, we, you know, we, we're finishing off this theme on money. Um, and and I think what we've spoken about is your specialization is about consumer economics. Uh, right. And I think it's really interesting seeing, you know, that, that ourselves as consumers, and, and it's been a tendency that's really been accelerated over the, the, you know, with Corona, especially as well, like, you know, where these individual people sitting at home, watching Netflix and buying stuff and ordering it, and then people are bringing it to our homes kind of thing, right? And, and so how are we doing that? And, 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 and what is it that we're consuming? And what does it mean actually to consume things? These are some things that I hope we're going to dive into uh, okay. a little bit. Uh, but we here at Manifesto, we have these 10 principles uh, and we go, we have one principle that we bring up every single week and we say like, this is kind of to form the discussion. So this print this week, I've, I've chosen the principle. It's our principle number seven, which is, we've called virtuous patriarchy, mm -hmm. uh, which is normally a bit of a, a, but what we've written about that is that we said the paradigm shift to an increasingly digital society requires visionary, strong and responsible men grounded on a strong foundation to step up in formulating new paradigmatic principles which foster lives of freedom, integration, meaning, and well-being. Mm, I like that. I yeah. like that. So, so, and, 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 so a, a little story, and we always have a little story to, to illustrate it. And, and the, the story that I, I picked out was just yesterday, I was talking to a friend uh, and, and he was talking about, we're talking about Paul, Paul McCartney from the Beatles. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and he was just like, oh, yeah, if I was just like Paul McCartney and we had like the money and the fame and the success that Paul McCartney had had, then everything would be great. And I wouldn't have had any problems. This guy's he's been having a bit of a hard time recently as well. Um, mm. And, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe if we're all just like Paul McCartney, then things would be great. But I, I kind of think like there's something else than just this image of like, you know, happiness that society puts out for us as well. Yes. Um, and, and I think that's part of the reason that you're working on as well. So... So yeah, um, consumer economics, can you just start off with telling us a little bit like what got you into that? Why, why was that interesting for you? <laughs> and um, yeah, where, where, where did, how did your personal journey lead you to working with this kind of stuff? Sure. Well, um, let's start with um, when I first went from being an attorney to being a teacher, uh, somebody said to me, well, you are a business litigation attorney, you must know economics which I laughed. I said, you don't know attorneys then because <laughs> we have trouble balancing a budget like anyone else. But I started teaching it and the books all talked about people being rational consumers who make logical decisions, thinking about things. And I looked around that just wasn't the way we do things. Um, you know, I'm driving a perfectly good car and then someone pulls up next to me in a bit nicer car and suddenly I have car envy and it's suddenly it's just not as good anymore 
So um, start delving into it. And the short answer is there's a n- relatively new branch of economics called behavioral economics. Mm-hmm. And what that focuses on is we're irrational. So let's lean into that irrationality and see what it is that drives us. Mm -hmm. Um, Consumer economics obviously focuses on the buying end of that. And then there's something else uh, about the force that drives us uh, that's called media literacy, Mm -hmm. understanding what it is that drives us. Mm -hmm. Um, If I were to ask you, uh, and everyone can do this without as little thought as possible. If I said, name a candy bar, what would you say? Uh, I'd say bar one. Bar one. Okay. Yeah. Now, or Snickers. Or Snickers. Snickers is what okay. I was thinking of. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we go into your brain and look, the first thing people are going to say is, well, it's the taste. But the fact is, if we go back and look, there have been so many what are called nudges for you to evoke that could be that you had a, a you know a grandfather who loved them or the color or smell remind you of a certain moment in your past and we find that consumer choices are kind of like stalagmites you know those giant uh, formations in caves they're mm-hmm. formed one drip at a time mm-hmm. by the way if you see in the back that's my wife trying to control we have a young cat who is tearing apart the house right now. <laughs> and so she's trying to rein the cat in. So I apologize. But that's basically what consumer economics is about, is studying our irrational choices and why do we make them and what can we do to counter those, the bad irrational choices. Okay. And, and so... What has been the the biggest challenges or or issues that you see in the way that we make our choices today? Just to dive a little bit further into that. Well, <laughs> I make an analogy. Um, I'm a Marvel comics fan. I'm I, I'm old, but I grew up originally watching the comics, and now I try not to miss an MCU movie. Mm-hmm. And if you notice in those movies, there's usually one everyday person who just freezes and waits for the superhero to save them. Mm -hmm. I feel like often in our consumerism, we're all waiting for a particular superhero to save us. And that future, and that superhero is called future me. Mm -hmm. Future me is a version of ourselves who will have plenty of money to cover our debt, will redeem all airline points, will call his mother every day, you know, all those things that we swear we'll get around to. And we rely on future me to solve our problems. And the disappointment comes when it turns out future me is often same old me. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, well, where's the superhero with the money to pay off the credit card or the debt or to finally pay the bill when the lifestyle comes due? Mm -hmm. And it's a very big challenge because we want to be optimistic, but we also have to be realistic about future me's abilities mm-hmm. yeah yeah and and present me's lack of ability to plan or even right. you know, aversion to making any kind of steps towards planning so one of the things we do here on manifesto in, in these groups is that we have guys who sit down and they actually try to set a goal for themselves three months three months out in the future <laughs> yeah. and they have to do that and, based on like well where do i want to be 10 years from now well, and just having that conversation, you know, like some people, they can think like, you know, oh, I have a hard time like getting to next week, but like 10 years from now, that's crazy, right? So well, that's exactly. Um, uh, I have my, one of my writing partners, we do a lot of uh, what we call here riffing. I don't know if you know that term riffing, where it actually comes from jazz, where you take some melody and you run with it on your own and things. So we were actually riffing about future me. And he said something brilliant. He said, um, well, why is it in the superhero, to extend the metaphor, why is it everyone waits to help the superhero out, the common people, when the superhero's down? Why not help them beforehand? So we've talked about how do you, how can you today help future me? And, you know, the little things like, well, give future me the most money you can by, by investing money early, by mm-hmm. socking it away in, you know, a 401k. Mm-hmm. Don't trap your present me in a lifestyle that future me can't pay for um, and create expectations that future me will create it. And um, 
get into good habits now so that, you know, it's sort of like if you work out now, future me will have an easier time working out physically. Well, the same thing happens financially. Mm -hmm. Get in good financial habits now and future me will have an easier time helping you out when the time comes. Are you familiar with Jordan Peterson? He, he speaks about this idea of, of sacrifice because uh, that's yes. basically what we're talking about, right? It's, it's this ancient, ancient idea that, 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 you know, that humans found upon. And, and the, the first way it appears was through this thing of like sacrifice as a way of negotiating with the future somehow. So it's a pretty complex yes. idea somehow, but, but that's basically what we're doing. You're, you're sacrificing yourself, your time, your energy, your comfort now for yourself for, for something else that, that you want to invest in uh, that isn't immediately apparent, right? Which is a, almost a unique human ability in some ways. It, it is because, um, you know, going back to basic economics, it's cost benefit. And the hard, the challenge we have is you have a tangible benefit now, but you don't realize the cost it will be in the future. And countering that with an intent as right now, intangible benefit you'll get in the future. Look, I'm 60 years old and I still love to play tennis, but I'm regretting the times I miss not stretching enough <laughs> 20, 30 years ago. And if I had taken that time when I just wanted to, oh, I just want to get on the court and play. And so you realize later in your life that that moment investing, you know, sacrifice is the same as investing. It pays off more mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. So... So Jim, can, can I kind of try and challenge the whole paradigm a little bit? I actually don't know how you're going to react to this at all, because you're like the, a financial guy. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I really, you know, think about is like when, when we're staying inside this whole Western, I guess it came out of the Enlightenment, right? The framework mm -hmm. of, you know, like rationality and economics and homo economicus as the human being. Then we have behavioral mm -hmm. economics that tries to account for all of these things, but there's still a, a mindset like, you know, consuming as much as possible or an assumption, I would say, consuming as much as possible uh, and, you know, generating as much wealth as possible, uh, having as much resources as possible. Uh, this is, you know, this is always a good and it's like a kind of a, a never ending goal in some ways. Uh, I've been mm -hmm. reading a lot about from a guy called Paul Kingsnorth recently. I, I don't know. He's he's become a, a very well known commentator on the COVID situation, mm -hmm. um, but he's, he's also like an old hippie environmental activist okay. who's kind of gone mainstream now in some ways. Um, and I actually brought a quote from him, um, which, which, which is from, he, he has an essay called Want is the Acid. Uh, and, and so he, it's basically saying like our wanting and wanting and wanting things all the time is this kind of like drug that we're, that we're mm -hmm. addicted to. So I'm, I'm going to read the quote up and then I'd love to hear what your reaction is to it. Okay. He says, and maybe it'll tie in well, I don't know, we'll see. But he says, eating, drinking, Buying colorful things, Vote, boats, vans, bikes, beer, steak, new clothes, secondhand clothes, burgers, chocolate bars, old castles, stately homes, cappuccinos, pirate adventure parks, golf courses, spas, tea rooms, pubs, food, drink, fun, entertainment, games, probably some sex somewhere in the mix. All of it came together suddenly into kind of package of sensory overload. And I mm -hmm. saw that this was what we were and what we had become without really thinking or planning it. Stimulating the senses, then reacting to the stimulus. This was what our society was all about. Feeding the pleasure centers, spending and spending to keep it all coming at us. Mm, excellent, excellent. Because, you know, uh, one of the ironies of my age group was everyone, uh, at least in America, grew up fearful of 1984, where the government is going to take over by uh, limiting your freedoms. And instead, what many see in the economic world, which relates to that quote, is it's more like Brave New World, where you are so overwhelmed with stimulation that you sort of just give up your free will and free choice because you're comfortable. And, and because you're comfortable, you just sort of relax and um, don't think about, is this healthy for me? Um, I just wrote a piece on, um, it's called the, um, at the super normal stimulus response. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's this psychological um, biologist identify that we are driven by certain impulses for things, but 
there's no off, off switch. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, in the animal world, birds tend to sit on more colorful eggs. Uh, but if you give them a fake colorful egg, they will sit on that, even letting their own eggs die. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn how to turn off our responses or at least temper them to all this stimulation and things being offered to us. Mm -hmm. um, and there are little tricks you can do. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I can't do without. There's a happy medium. Um, one of my favorite authors, who's very hard to read, but Thorstein Veblen uh, in 1899 is sometimes called the father of behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And he does a wonderful thing just about spoons that I, I'm constantly quoting. And he says, if you think about spoons, what is it the wealthy want? They want silver spoons. Well, if you think about a silver spoon, it actually costs a lot. Uh, you have to polish them and you have to pay to secure them. There's all these hidden costs. A wooden spoon, on the other hand, can do just about everything that a silver spoon can and is easier to manage. You don't worry if you lose it. And there's a really great 120 year old cautionary tale there about just in life, look for the wooden spoons when you need something. If you just start with that, um, then maybe it's an adjustment or a redirection of your life towards the better, towards things like experiences over things um, and putting things in order. So that's sort of me riffing on that quote there, I guess. <laughs> No, it's, I, I think that's a beautiful illustration of uh, putting things in order, like you said, like, you know, like there's a, there's a sense in which so many things are upside down or the wrong way around and, and mm -hmm. our hierarchies of value in our society are, are driven by, you know, colorful eggs and silver spoons, maybe mm -hmm. more than, yeah. than they're driven by what's actually rational or what actually makes sense or, or what one would do if one had a clear view of reality. Um, right. There's a guy called René Girard who has this theory about what's called mimetic desire, that basically we're, we're just, we, we want what everybody else wants, and we just copy, right. uh, desire, desire is mimetic, right, we just copy, and, and this leads to an escalation often of, of violence, because we all want the same things, uh, and, and this is, and then the scapegoat mechanism, he's the guy who guys really kind of popularized the scapegoat mechanism, which he sees as what comes yes. out of this, basically, it's a way of resolving uh, the tension that, that comes mm -hmm. from that. Um, yeah. So maybe I mean, so so if if you if we could talk a little bit about our own lives. So I, I've recently moved to a farm, uh, oh. and mm -hmm. I I don't have a television here, um, mm -hmm. and I still though you know get attracted by all kinds of you know social media yeah. and platforms and screens and things like that. So I, I feel it's like a battle. Um, can you talk tell a little bit about you know if we can sure. dive into like uh, what have you been doing? to rewire your, or make sure that you're orientating yourself correctly in what's often a bit of a crazy upside down world. Sure. Um, well, I have to say that um, it, it does help. We, we're not all lucky enough to have this, but um, I happen to have a partner, my wife, who is incredibly cheap. And I mean, that in the best way. And, you know, it's sort of like, Younger people don't know this day, but um, when you get a car, it used to be in the old days, like my first car I ever had, if I took my hands off the wheel, it just naturally went to the right. So I was constantly on that first car, counter steering to the left, just to keep it in the lane. And um, what we have to do is realize which way we naturally steer and then counter steer it. And I'll give you an example. Um, we just took a holiday in Greece and Turkey. And when you go there, um, of course, there's all the tourist places and there's all these great restaurants and there's usually a restaurant row where they have all the wonderful blue and white napkins and everything. Well, one habit we always make is we ask people, where do the locals eat? Mm -hmm. You know, just you make that little bit of extra effort mm -hmm. to just say, where do the locals eat? Because you'll get more authentic food and cheaper. And actually, we discovered a whole little town with a town square that was just fantastic. Um, and you have to just ask these conscious questions. Um, in our own house, what we did was we raised two sons. 
And then when they went off, we did what we could. We said, we can't do any more, off you go. Um, we sold the house because we didn't need the space and we bought a townhome. And it's smaller by American standards, but that's not the point. The point is it's enough for us. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as we have a guest bedroom for, so that we can put guilt on our sons to say, why haven't you used it? Um, <laughs> It's enough for us. Uh, one of the things we loved, we lived in Europe and um, for three years we lived in Spain and the cost of living is much better than in America. And then when we explain it, people go, but, but do you live in a shoebox? Do you live in, a, and they have all these concepts and we say, we live by enough. Mm -hmm. And we found that we love the European living. We love, you know, flats there, as you know, uh, for us, we love that they were made to get outside mm -hmm. rather than this super big box that was made for being inside and half the time you don't use the rooms. Mm -hmm. So, oh, and one more thing I just is we always pattern as a family our vacations on experience. Mm -hmm. um, I always say to people, you know, if you think back to a great vacation, you remember the memories, the experiences, but you can't remember what you ate. You'll say, oh, we had a great meal. But it's less the things and more the feelings. I can tell you my first date with my wife. I can tell you exactly how I felt, the conversation. I can't remember exactly what I ate. Mm -hmm. So we build experiences like that. One vacation, we strapped on the backpacks with our sons and we backpacked New York, Philadelphia, and DC. We did it as if we were, um, you know, European tourists backpacking, mm -hmm. staying in a hostel rather than staying in the fancy places. And it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah getting out of your normal comfort zone, but also understanding your, I love the counter steering example. I thought that made so much sense. Uh, yeah. and, and the things that I thought of when you were talking about that was the habits that I consciously develop and cultivate in myself uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of how, you know, how I just go through my day that, you know, then, and, and this is something that you can really take control of. And then the other one, you mentioned your wife. I have a, you have a cheap wife. I have a cheap wife as well. It's really nice to have a cheap wife. Um, but like the people that you surround yourself with, right? The relationships uh, that, you, that you do and, and you know, yeah. having, a, having a wife that, you know, just loves to have lots and lots of shoes. If, if you see some, a woman who has like shoes and lots of, and bags, yeah. then like, that's not a cheap thing to have. <laughs> there's a lot of money that could go down that way, right? Like it, you know, there's different priorities, right? Um, so. Um, and that's but, that's exactly we also um you know again with the counter steering i'm very much a um time is money so my sort of gut is if we're shopping for something i will quickly grab the first thing i know this is the way i go and i say good enough i don't want to spend any more money and she fortunately will say okay let's just look at two more things let's just see if there's something and usually she'll find a deal yeah. Um, Look at the, the 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 shelves a little bit lower down. There's always yes, <laughs> yes, the lower shelves. Or even have you looked at this store? You know, so yeah. um, you know, if you have someone or even some way to remind you, um, you know, I did another piece where I talked about how you do reminders for yourself. Put it on your calendar, um, and just a little things of do or don't do today. Just remind yourself the way you normally steer and counter steer a little bit until it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. Great. So there we haven't really got into Jim and I, I want to go into this and then we're going to afterwards uh, open up for questions from the other guys. Um, uh, but uh, it's the area of media because I know that you've really yes. you're really thought a lot and written a lot about and written books about how media is changing and how ch changing media are changing the way that we're interacting uh, with, yes. us, with the world as, as consumers. Um, so yeah, can you can you exp unwrap that a little bit for us uh, before we sure. then we then we'll stop the recording and go over to the community part of the of the meeting after that? Sure. Um, if I could tell a um, quick little story that one thing and it had to involve one of my sons who's now in his late twenties, but when he was a kid, we uh, watched TV and there was a show um, that was put on uh, uh, by the Disney Network. I'll go ahead and say it. And what they did was. They review, it was kids who reviewed Disney movies. Now, they only reviewed Disney movies and they always loved them, okay? Now, one time they were reviewing a movie that every reviewer said was terrible. 
was awful. They said you could feel your brain melt as, as you watched it. Don't go see it. But these kids all loved the movie. And my son turned to me and said, Dad, we got to go see this movie. Mm-hmm. And I said, Ben, what makes you think these guys are telling you the truth? And my son, his lips started trembling. And he says, why would children lie to me? Mm-hmm. And I and it was sort of a revelation that he didn't understand he was playing a game. He, he didn't even understand he was in the middle of a game he wasn't even playing. That these were, in fact, employees of a major corporation pitching something. And advertising now, we think of advertising as this person who gets in your face or on TV who says, buy this. But it's much more subtle now. We're inundated and there's a thousand little nudges that push it. Everything from sports events brought to you by. And the fact is, it works. There may not be, we may not watch as much television today, but if you watch YouTube, uh, there's a constant scroll. Um, And it's just in your sight, in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do, the way I used to say to um, my students was, if you want to buy a designer shirt, my course is not designed to say, don't buy a designer shirt. It's to look through the hype and understand what you are buying. And then make an active conscious decision. Don't just blindly accept it. I mean, look, as a lawyer, I had a couple of special power suits. I think they were Armani that I felt better putting on. Now I knew they, the quality is, wasn't going to change what I said in court, but I consciously felt better. That's okay for my choice. As long as I am aware, it's not actually giving me superpowers. And we have to cut through advertising because they're going to appeal to things. You mentioned Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a great ad a couple of years ago by uh, an investment company that said, this is Paul McCartney. And they said, he's been a quarryman, a beetle, a knight, a writer, and all that, you know, and all this. And then it said, we'll help you reach your dreams as well. (laughs) <laughs> and the funny thing is, is I used to show this ad and I'd say to the kids, do you think Paul McCartney got to his money by using this investment company? Or are they tapping into my love of Paul McCartney, forgetting that along the way he wrote a song called Yesterday and some other stuff that got him there? Yeah. No, it, it's amazing. I mean, you, it's so basic. It's so basic. So I I often post post pictures on social media about manifesto and I can see how they do. And if there happens to be a beautiful woman, uh, a fast car or like some kind of like heavy machinery, like masculine kind of chainsawing or something like that, like like the the number of hits just like skyrockets, right? Uh, Absolutely. And they they know us better than we know us. mm -hmm. And so they know what triggers um, and, you know, it, it even gets down to the colors. Uh, for example, in, an, in a health ad for a health product, you won't see the color red because that implies unhealthy. You will see blue and green. So, you know, my area of media literacy is deconstructing all these ads and this language, hidden language and techniques, mm-hmm. um, like fear of missing out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this idea that everyone else has one. Why don't you? Mm-hmm. And they do it very subtly. Um, you know, um, and sometimes it's not so subtle because, uh, for example, I'm living here in Dallas. I'm a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. And for a while, they used to have the star quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys doing an ad for bricks, as in the things that build your house. Mm-hmm. Now, people responded positively, even though what does a quarterback have to do with bricks? Yeah, there's no, there doesn't need to be any logical conclusion. Just no. seeing those things together, uh, it, it just works, right? Yes. So, so what, what we just, you, you've spoken about like, you know, just becoming aware of these things and these connections and, and, and having conversations about it. Is that what, what we need to do? Or what, what's the, what, what should I be our response to, to seeing, yeah, to, to realizing this? Well, part of the problem is, um, you know, it, takes a lot. This is why there are a few true uh, existentialists, because to constantly be aware of, am I 
consciously making decisions is exhausting. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we need to do is sort of figure out where are our weak spots? Where, which way does our car naturally turn? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you a sucker for fashion? Are you a sucker for, um, I love computer games. Um, and so if I see something that is a great ad, I want to immediately go and they've made it so easy just to buy it. Mm -hmm. And I have to know that's my weak spot. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes what I do when teaching younger kids is I have them look for techniques. Uh, and sometimes it's fun, no matter what your age, to realize what is the technique. Um, there was uh, Jaguar uh, had a, a campaign a number of years ago called Gorgeous. And we did an experiment showing it to um, men. And I'd say, they'd watch it and I'd say, how do you feel about the car? They'd say, love it. And I'd say, what do you know about the car from the ad? And what it showed basically was older men and younger women. Mm -hmm. And that's really all the ad was, mm -hmm. but it was a positive. So if you are someone who goes, you know, that triggers me and we all have our own secret triggers, you know, mm -hmm. then you have to stop and say, wait a minute, this is my danger zone. Yeah. The first course that I did on marketing, the yes. basic framework was uh, you have to use the seven deadly sins. So you mm -hmm. appeal to those sins. You, you appeal to people's passions, to their, you know, kind of like more primal, uh, deeper, sinful desires. And, and, and that's how you get them. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. we, we have already been shaped. I mean, you know, again, um, you can't undo it. I was born in Dallas. I will always be a Dallas Cowboys fan. Mm -hmm. um, and I was nudged that way before I could read my dad, you know, taking me to games, but I also have to be aware. And it's kind of a silly analogy. There are other teams too, and I can't just hate all the other teams. So, um, you know, if you know, you tend to have a particular bent towards gluttony or whatever sin, uh, then you have to be aware and maybe do a reminder. I know people who, um, one guy, um, uh, was having tattoo of a yin and yang on his wrist to remind him <laughs> to take a pause mm -hmm. so we put in you know we all have bracelets that uh, remind us of good things but they can also remind us you just have to as much as possible be conscious of it um i did a piece on marcus aurelius the philosopher um emperor mm -hmm. and i loved his philosophy that there is a natural flow to the world but you can't just close your eyes and join it. You have to be consciously making sure you are going in the flow properly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. You can't force it. And a lot of times we tend to use money to try to force the flow to go in our direction mm -hmm. um, by buying things that we think will make us happiness rather than realize what is the natural flow of happiness not what advertising says, but what we want. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a perfect jumping off point. We normally go a level deeper in our conversation when we hit off the recording button here and step out of commercial uh, okay. online <laughs> world. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll do that and say goodbye to the people who are following us uh, on the recording. Thanks for watching. My name's Paul. I'm one of the founders of Manifesto. And this was just a little taste of some of the kind of conversations that we're having here on Manifesto. If you'd like to join in the discussion, then check out our website on the links below. And please remember to like this video and to subscribe to get the next updates. Cheers.